Um, thank you all for joining us. It's, it's great to see all of you have come back um, to join the discussion. We really appreciate it. I hope you didn't have any issues uh, with the YouTube link. Um, and now just to note that the YouTube link is live, so please feel free to share the video if you'd like. Um, so our discussion will be an hour long. And just before we begin with it, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping notes. Um, just, you know, as you know, the, the chat feature is on the right of the Zoom. Please feel free to discuss things um, while we're speaking. If you do have a question, um, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Please use that for questions. We won't be monitoring the comments box for questions for this um, session. So um, as I said, welcome everybody. Um, we're so glad you're here. Um, just a quickly overview of what we're gonna do today. We've got two um, sessions that this is gonna be divided into. The first we'll discuss um, with some of those who have been involved in the film, both as participants and the filmmaker, which we're really happy to have here. And then we'll also speak to some of our colleagues who are living with diabetes to share a bit about their experiences. So to help provide a little bit more perspective on the issue of access to insulin. So um, yeah, with that, we'll begin. So um, our very first film panelist will be um, Stephen Maud, who is the creative director of Cloud9 Media. And we were really lucky to have him and his crew help us uh, make this film and say what we wanted to say about access to insulin. So um, Steve, again, thank you so much to you and Bruna and Danny. It was really great working with you. Um, so if you could just, you know, first question is what interested you in working on this project? Um, well, it's work. <laughs> No, I mean, I've um, so I've been making films about diseases um, around the world since 2009. Um, I'm a, you know, traveling cameraman and working for different um, NGOs and different people. And I'd always made films about malaria, HIV, TB, all the kind of the, the, the high priority uh, diseases, as it were. And I'm a type one diabetic myself. So obviously when a request came through to tell a story about diabetes, um, from a purely selfish point of view, I was fascinated because, you know, I've always traveled around the world um, managing my own diabetes um, with type one. And it's really difficult. Molly, you know that, you know, we're, <laughs> we, um, and especially in, you know, in hot countries, um, I, I have amazing technology now, a little uh, freezer bag that I can keep my insulin cool and all of these things. And I always remember filming, I was in Conakry, I think, and I met a, a, a person living with diabetes there and I was like, how do you, how, how do you cope? You know, we have fridges, you know, they, they, they didn't even have a fridge. So, um, so it was a very interesting um, topic for me to, to look more into. Um, and I was also just curious, really, because diabetes for me being you know a, a westerner has always been my disease <laughs> you know it's like people people in the developing world have have malaria and obviously these other um very pressing and very serious diseases but you know it was always like diabetes was sort of in my mind a kind of western thing and i was like yeah but there are 422 million people living with it across the planet so of course it's going to be everywhere um so so that was, yeah, I, I just wanted to, I was fascinated to sort of see how other people cope with what is a very complicated disease. And, um, and I found even more complication as I chatted to people in researching the film and everything. Um, there's, it's such a sort of, it, you know, there's so many different facets of, of managing the disease itself, getting the supply, controlling the cost of insulin and all of these things. Um, as I discovered as I went along the way. Thanks, Steve. And yeah, it, it was um, it was nice to have somebody who knew some of you know the background of, of diabetes. So you you know you were kind of one step ahead from the beginning. That was really nice. Mm. Now, um, one question which I know a lot of people have already asked me is this: as we were able to make this sort of global film, how were you able to do it within sort of the restrictions of of COVID and, and the time that we're living in at the moment? Yeah. So, I mean, 
everything has everything has changed and and in a way the pandemic's brought some good good changes as well uh, i used to go away on shoots myself um, i'd work with a local crew and just go out and sort of get the story and then with this there was no travel so uh, we were reliant on building up our network of um, crew in different parts of the world um, and luckily i'd worked with a, a fixer when i was at the bbc uh, in peru uh, called deborah and um, she was wonderful and I think the, le the lesson we learn is that we, we, we control everything, you know, from here, from, from the UK, um, and yet we are present on the shoots out there, you know, thanks to Zoom technology, you know, we can, I, I did interviews, um, and in fact, I, the, we, we do use some Zoom, Zoom interviews in the film itself, but, you know, luckily there's, there's some great tech around which allowed me to be present on the shoots. Um, and you have to really brief and trust people and communicate and collaborate much better and empower people. And in a way, Deborah went off and uh, with, with a brief and we spoke to Dr. Leon um, as well, who unfortunately got, <laughs> he, I hope you've recovered from, from, the, from the virus, Dr. Leon. Um, but she, uh, she, she went out and spoke to lots of people and found these stories for us um, and we storyboarded and put all of that together. So in a way, it's, it, it kind of, it almost helps because you have a local person on the ground that really knows what they're talking about. Um, and that, that uh, in a way, gives a stronger, a stronger product, you know? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Um, and so you already mentioned a little bit about, um, you know, how this work sort of changed your perspective. But I'm wondering, what was, was, what was sort of the most surprising thing about this work, either negative or positive, what sort of really, you know, shifted your perspective on sort of the idea of global access to insulin and what you knew about it beforehand? I guess it's sort of on it, on two two sides really. Um, on the negative side, in a way, it's it's just the sheer injustice of it and how lucky I am. You know, I live in London, I live in England. I have the National Health Service. I have my insulin for free. Not only that, I have the latest, best insulins, you know, the kind of Ferrari. And then meeting people like Ednan um, and Juana in Peru, you know, they are, they're on the basic, they're on the old insulins that I was trained to manage my diabetes with 30 years ago. You know, it's like, it's, and, it's, and I know as a, as a patient living with a very complicated disease, if you're kind of left in the shadows uh, in, that, in that sense, it's, it's it's devastating you know the quality of life that 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 these people have to put up with managing a very complicated disease and then not having that support from doctors you know i mean every every person living with diabetes has a diabetic consultant somewhere behind there who's really helping them learn to manage this and and there's none of that and then also just the fact that they're having to pay an unfair amount for something that i get for free I just, it's just, you know, the, the mind boggles and it does really make you feel this sense that diabetes is a kind of, it is a social disease <laughs> in a way, <clears throat> in that, you know, in Peru, you have people living with diabetes who are um, middle class and have, have the money to pay for the, for the treatment. And also they're part of, you know, they're on Facebook, they have their sort of social groups, they have a support network, um, which is something that, there's a h other whole side of people who live in the more remote areas who don't have enough money to be online on Facebook all day long, and um, and they're and they're on their own, you know. So it's a very it's it's a two-sided story in a way, um, which uh, which shocked me. But also, what was lovely was the just the resourcefulness of of, of people living with it, and in a way, in Mali, um, the the little kid that we filmed, um, Baba. You know, he's, he's just so sweet. And he says, on, on, on s'adapte, il faut adapter. <laughs> you, know, you, learn, you learn to adapt and they have the basics. But you look at that child and you think he's going to grow up and he's going to be OK. You know, and I found that incredibly. I mean, the work of Stéphane Besançon at, at Santé Diabète is, is just wonderful. So, so in a way, it was kind of the, the negative shock of, of, of the reality of the situation, but also this kind of sense of hope. And, and this could, like, uh, as, as Jeff Gill says, you know, there is a community and it's a community that I, 
I feel part of now. And to be honest, I make more of an effort to control my diabetes because I think I've got no excuse. Yeah, thanks, Steve. It's true. Once you sort of feel part of the community, you do actually pay more attention for yourself as well, which is an, a very positive outcome as well. Yeah. Um, and thanks, Steve, also for mentioning Stefan, because actually we're going to go to Stefan next. So, Steve, I mean, we'll ask you one more question, but we're going to go to the rest of the panelists now. Um, so I think everyone saw Stefan was in the film. He's um, the CEO of Santa Diabet, which is in Mali and France and now in some other countries as well in the region. And unfortunately, he was traveling today, but um, I asked him some questions last week, which we um, put on video and we're going to play right now. Aspect to strength access to insulin, uh, to work uh, on geographic uh, access by improving purchasing and distribution in the country, in the capital, but also in the in the different region. But also on the other aspect, on the financial access uh, by providing insulin coverage in the social security. Uh, set up by the Mayan government for employees. And I think uh, this close collaboration is very, very important because it permits to work on the both sides, on geographic access, but also on financial uh, access and to, to, to work uh, very uh, quickly on all initiatives uh, made by the government. So this point for me is a central, central and crucial point to uh, improve the access to insulin and uh, more broadly to uh, drugs. In Mali, uh, there was a social security for employers, only it's 17% uh, of the population. So uh, the next step uh, is uh, for insulin to be included uh, in the reimbursement uh, for the universal health coverage that will be implemented in Mali. Uh, so that the financial access uh, will be facilitated for the entire population and not just for 17% of the population. That, that is uh, very, very important to uh, include uh, as insulin access in the new uh, um, universal health coverage in Mali. Uh, but also, uh, next step, we want to continue a strong advocacy uh, in this universal health coverage to uh, obtain and provide free access to insulin for children with type 1 diabetes. And uh, in Mali, it's a two to uh, main uh, next step uh, to continue to improve uh, insulin access. Oh, at global level, uh, the first thing, we must continue a very strong, strong advocacy uh, on the manufacturers, on the big three uh, and other producers to reduce uh, the, the price of insulin very sharply uh, because we know uh, that they can do if they want to do. So it's very important to continue this advocacy, very strong advocacy. And in addition, uh, there is an urgent need to support uh, the establishment in, in many, many countries of universal health coverage who include insulin uh, access uh, in different countries. Uh, these two points is very, very important to decrease the price with the producer and to include uh, the insulin in the universal health coverage in many, many, many countries. Great. Um, so um, I think one message that Stefan says that um, is really important, and I think will probably come up again, and I think I saw it already in the chat, is this idea of including um, insulin in universal health coverage. And of course, for that to happen, um, insulin must be affordable so that countries can buy it and, and supply it to everybody in need within the country. Um, so again, we're really happy Stefan could share his message. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here, but he was really a great resource for us um, 
for this video. Um, so next, I'm going to um, ask a few questions of Dr. Carla Silver, Silva Matos, who is um, with the Ministry of Health at Mozambique and a great friend of um, ACT, the Access Study and has done a lot of really fantastic work with diabetes in Mozambique. Hello, Carla. I think you're on mute, Carla. Yeah. Oh, there you are, good. Hi. Okay. Hi, Carla, great to see you. Great to see you too. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna, you know, at the beginning of the video, um, the story you told was really impactful about children living with diabetes in Mozambique and their survival rate. I'm wondering if you could um, tell us how it's going for people with diabetes in Mozambique currently and talk about the situation and what is currently the key barrier there. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Um, well, since 2002, um, I think that uh, the access to insulin in, in Mozambique um, increased a little bit. The access for diagnosis for diabetes are increased too, because we did, we create a, a department of non-communicable disease in Mozambique in that time, and um, the non-communicable disease now is a priority um, in the government. So, uh, and uh, we, um, we, come on, this aumentam, we improve, the capacity of uh, diabetes association uh, in Mozambique. Um, so these three actions uh, made uh, the access uh, better, okay? Especially for insulin. But this insulin is uh, still available only in the main, the provincial and um, the central hospitals in all the country. Okay, still very, very, uh, because of the problems, if you don't know how to, uh, to apply the insulin, you can, you can kill eh, the, the patient. So, and we have lack of education in our patients. Uh, we need to increase the, the education so that uh, they can make better uh, control. Uh, we need to, to, to teach them how to use insulin themselves. And, um, you know, the whole, the whole education about diabetes, uh, we have very, 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 very much on that. Um, but we still have a problem uh, with the price of insulin, not in the, in the system, in the health system. In the health system, the insulin is selling uh, to, um, uh, lower price, okay? But if we, we don't, if the patient cannot afford the insulin in the health system, maybe uh, you need to go to the private system, uh, sector and in the private sector, it's horrible. The prices is, uh, they can't, they can't uh, uh, use it. And even in the, in, the, in the health system, for example, if you, um, prescribe three vials of uh, insulin for one patient uh, and it goes to the pharmacy, okay, in the hospital pharmacy, the, the technician, uh, because it's not um, the number of vials that he, he, he gave is not sufficient for all the patients, okay, instead to give him a three, he will give one vial, okay. And uh, on top of that problem, the patient goes to go home with this vial and don't have a refrigerator. Okay? And you can imagine all the problems. That's why now, for example, we can find uh, young people already with the um, blind, you see? like uh, with 15 years old, uh, completely blind and uh, with the uh, uh, diabetic food, uh, you know, uh, very uh, lots of complications. 
Um, and uh, we still have uh, one uh, challenge is with the syringes. The syringes, it's not um, enough for all uh, patients that we, that we, uh, we have. So in generally in the country, what I can say is yes, we have some improve, but we still have a very big challenge in this whole aspect that uh, I told you. Uh, so I think that uh, we need to improve the quantification of the insulin and syringes and the other diabetic uh, medicines. Uh, we need to do better planification and the distribution of the, the, the insulin and the other medicines. Um, we need, we don't, we still don't have enough and uh, with good quality data about the diabetes, especially the uh, um, pedi pediatric uh, uh, diabetes patients, okay? And uh, the education, it's very, very, very important. Very important. Uh, you know, without education, you can say whatever you, you want, you can give the insulin, we can give the syringes and the everything. But if the patient is not educated about uh, their disease, they cannot make it improve. Great. Thank you, Carla, so much. And I think. That's uh, such, uh, you raised a lot of really good points, but I think, you know, getting access to insulin is one thing, but you have to have that insulin be able to go into the body and people know how to use it. And those, those things are just as important um, and need to always be considered, you know, access, access to insulin is one step, but there's so many other steps to ensuring good care for people with diabetes. So thank you for raising that point. Yeah. And another point I think you raised, which is um, super interesting and will talk about this as well with our next speaker is this availability, you know, insulin might be available in some facilities like in the cities or whatever, but, you know, reaching those people in regional areas, and if it's not available, them having to pay much, much higher prices in the private sector is a real problem. Um, and so if there's not enough insulin available, um, and it's only available in the private sector, people, again, aren't able to access affordable insulin. Um, and I think that's what we saw in, in the story in Peru. Um, so thank you, Carla, and I'll come back to you in a little bit, but I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna move on now um, to Dr. Franco Ernestes Leon Jimenez, who um, is an internal, works in internal medicine at the Hospital Santa de Rosa in Pira, Peru. And he unfortunately wasn't able to participate in the actual filming of, um, the documentary, but he was a very helpful resource for us um, in terms of the area and understanding what was going on um, and the, the patients that we saw. So um, as I mentioned, you know, in the documentary, we saw some of the issues that are there for people in terms of availability of insulin, um, especially in, in regional areas. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about some of the other issues in terms of access um, that your patients um, are dealing with um, in your hospital, you know, outside of just access to insulin, be it um, what Carla mentioned, the supplies or um, care or, you know, rationing of insulin or, you know, what are the main challenges there? Thanks, Molly. Um, as you said, uh, we have a lot of problems in our hospital because uh, I, I, I want to divide it in, in some items. First, uh, it is difficult for patients uh, to, uh, because they have myths, beliefs and fears about the use of insulin. And uh, as uh, Carla said, we had to uh, um, educate patients and they, do, they have some myths, beliefs that, uh, it's difficult to afford. Uh, the other problem we have is that uh, the adherence with patients to use the insulin and the availability of a, a relative caregiver is, is important because uh, some patients do not understand how to use the insulin. And we have a lot of patients that uh, don't have, for example, a refrigerator 
to store it, uh, and then they cannot use it. So uh, when the patient uh, comes to the hospital and we uh, attend the patient, and the patient goes home, uh, uh, the patient and uh, the caregiver doesn't doesn't have uh, the opportunity to give the insulin because they they don't have a refrigerator, for example. No? Uh, the other problem we have we have is that uh, in this context of pandemic, uh, the availability of a teleconsultation because the patients are not coming to the hospital. So uh, the endocrinologist and the internal medicine physician have to uh, have a phone call with the patients and then. Uh, we have to give uh, and by telephone a uh, consultation, and I, I think it's not the better to do. Uh, and the other problem is that when the patient comes to the hospital, and or the or the caregiver comes to the hospital, they have difficulties to uh, to with the pharmacist to give the insulin because uh, or there is not a product or it has to return. And some people, uh, as the video showed, uh, live three to two hours from the hospital. So it's some difficult. And, 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 and they, uh, sometimes uh, we have to give the patients our telephone number, but they are calling now, calling and, and in every moment. And it's difficult to, to, to follow these patients. We don't have a, a structured uh, monitoring of them. Uh, the other uh, the other problem is that uh, there is a, a high competition with some insulins, brand name insulins that uh, some endocrinologists and some many may, and some uh, other doctors give. Uh, instead, uh, um, despite there are a lot of studies that the effectiveness is the same, no. The, the one that give the, the government is the same, the effectiveness is the same that the, the other brand insulin, that are most are, are expensive. Um, the other problem is uh, it's difficult for us to monitor each other patients because uh, sometimes in our hospital there are no auxiliary tests as glycemias, a, uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, proteinuria, and there's difficult for us to follow those patients and the dose of insulin we have to, to give them. Even as every patient with diabetes, mental health problems and chronic kidney disease are so frequently, so uh, the difficulty we have to monitor is that the doses of insulin uh, increases. Uh, I think um, uh, the other problem, uh, our Ministry of Health uh, supports the use of insulin and other, and other things for managing all the diabetes. Uh, but uh, the difficulty is the health education. Uh, we only uh, solve uh, little problems and not uh, educate the patient, not educate the doctors, and the problem uh, doesn't stop. Uh, I think education, self-care, shared decision-making with the patient is are fundamental. And the other problem is the corruption, the corruption and low middle income from uh, countries. That so we have to face with the difficulties to managing our patients. I, uh, these are the commentaries we have to. Great. Thank you very much. I mean, there's um, some. You've you've mentioned so many great points, and I think um, you know education and sort of all of the different sort of things that lead off that, you know, business overcoming stigma, understand, you know, making sure that, that the um, health, all the health force is, is trained to understand how diabetes and that families are, understand how to help their, you know, family members manage diabetes. I mean, there's, um, it, it, it's, you know, there's some real positives there and there's also, you realize there's a lot of barriers that we still have to overcome to make sure that people can, can really properly manage their diabetes. Um, great, thank you, you all three, so very much. I have just one last question for all of you, and we'll go uh, we'll go backwards now. So I'll we'll, I'll start with Dr. Leon, and we'll go around the other way. Um, you know, at the end of the film, we included sort of some some action points um, in what we think are sort of the critical 
global things that need to happen to improve access to insulin. I'm wondering, um, from your unique perspectives, what you see as this main action that needs to be taken to improve access to insulin. So, sir. Who's going first? <laughs> oh, sorry, I think I got cut off. Uh, Dr. Leon, please go ahead. I think the government and the Ministry of Health uh, should uh, uh, consider uh, not that diabetes not as a, a health problem, uh, uh, as, as a social problem. Uh, we have to, they have to consider all the costs the patient has, and those costs are not all considered. Uh, I don't know the the, the word tira uh, reactivas to control the, the glycemia and glucometers, and those are not considered in our health system. So we cannot control the patients with it if they don't have uh, this the things glucometers, uh, reactive tires to control the, the diabetes. And the other is uh, education of uh, patients and caregivers. I think it's it's fundamental to give education. We are not uh, achieving this. Great. Thank you. And I'm I'm really glad you you mentioned uh, glucose testing, home glucose testing, and test strips. I mean, I think the, the absolutely the whole package needs to be included for this management. It, it, it's so important. Um, okay, um, Dr. Carla, would you like to? Um, Add, go ahead now. Uh, well, uh, thank you again. I completely would agree. You know, um, the price of in insulin is still very, very, very high for people, at least for people with, uh, uh, in the uh, undeveloped countries like Mozambique, like in Peru, you know. So, uh, uh, I don't know how we can convince the um, suppliers <laughs> that uh, they should uh, make uh, at least the special price for our countries, okay? Because we don't afford this is, you know, uh, a serious problem here. And uh, I completely agree with the, what Franco said. And uh, maybe I will um, say that for me, uh, the education is very important. We should, um, we should uh, invest in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, you know, technologies, and, but simple, uh, simple things that we can use to educate our uh, diabetes patients. Because we can give them the, 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 the insulin for better price. We can give them the, the, even the refrigerators, okay? Because now we can have uh, with the final solar, uh, okay? And uh, or petrol, petrol is petrol, eh? petroleum. Uh, refrigerator that can function with the petrol, but if they are not educated about how to use this this uh, insulin, uh, we, we 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 cannot uh, achieve our goals. So for me, uh, the 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 the, uh, the actions that we can um, make now is to reduce the price and educate our our. Diabetes patients. Great. Thank you, Carla. Those are very, very clear. Thank you. Uh, Steve, would you like to take a stab at it? <laughs> um, well, I've, I've worked in neglected tropical diseases um, as well for many years. And, you know, that's been a, a very successful model where um, you've, you've got the sort of the World Health Organization taking it seriously and having it quite high up the list. Um, you have NGOs working locally who train up and support the ministries of health to roll out these long programs, you know, they're long-term programs to eliminate a disease. Um, and, 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 that, and, and then finally what they have are, you know, people like GSK and Merck who are donating the drugs. Um, now, 
I, I, insulin is not very expensive, but I feel like if we could have a similar model for diabetes where you have more santé diabète in, in, in certain countries, um, and obviously I, I, I'm generalizing and I'm you know, lumping in Mali with Peru and their, their, their circumstances are very different, but I think those countries that have the huge pressure of other diseases on, on, their, on their agendas, um, they need that support from the NGOs. Um, and also, alongside that, I just think the insulin should be donated, should be free. I mean, we're, they're making masses of money from people like, like me and, and markets um, abroad. And in these countries where um, people really can't afford it, it should be free. Um, so I don't know if that's going to, how that's going to wash with people. But It's great, Steve. Thanks. Uh, it's a, it's a good message. message. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good message. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry, Dr. Liam, do you have your hand up? Yes, I have, a, a, for example, a, the, the pitchman of a person that works in Peru is approximately $130. The test strips, if the government, if the Ministry of Health not give the person, is $31. Um, two uh, bottles of insulin, $36. So uh, we don't have in the, the people don't have uh, money to, to buy insulin. The people die. People complicated with uh, rental insufficiency and then the costs are, are, are more. So uh, yeah. Thank, thank, yeah, and I think when you put the numbers, you really realize actually how much this is costing people every month just to survive. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's an essential medicine, so it, they have to have it. Um, thanks very much, all three of you. If you could just hang on for the Q&A. We're just going to um, move over to two of our other uh, panelists who are um, both uh, also um, colleagues um, who work in Kyrgyzstan and Tanzania. Um, and they're both uh, living with diabetes. Uh, the first is Igorim Zarapova, who is the in-country coordinator at uh, SEC MDR TB Net Project, and Anita Belindi, who is an advocate and a content marketing manager in Tanzania. So if I could ask you both to um, unmute yourselves and put your cameras on, that would be great. Great. Hey, there you are, great. Hello. Hi, hi Molly, hi, hi everyone. Hi. Okay, uh, Anita, I'm gonna just ask you first, I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about the experiences either for yourself personally or in your country um, and what in Tanzania you see as the main barrier to access to insulin. Okay, uh, so the main problem is access to insulin, which I've, I've seen that it's really common in almost all the country is the different prices that one has to encounter from one area to another. It's more uh, that we expect that there are more expenses, maybe in urban areas and in rural areas, but the case can ultimately be all the same even in urban areas. Like for in Tanzania, you can find that simply at one part is $9, that, well, that's one well of actually, but somewhere else it's $6. And the distance is all the same, it's all in one urban area. And it gets a bit more hectic for uh, analog, especially because they are really not uh, covered by the government and they, they are fully on the patient. And a few studies or a few patients have, have a, a difficulty of really having a safe and standard management of diabetes with atrophies and lances. So they tend to move to analogs of Novorapid, uh, Apira, or lances. And they have to fully encounter on the cost and expenses of such insulin, especially because <clears throat> the, pub, uh, the public ins insurance companies do not cover the cost of this insulin. So you either have to endure the cost of getting a private insurance company or fully pay from pocket, which is ultimately very expensive. But also uh, in Tanzania, the one thing which we really have to look into when it comes to access of insulin is the living cost of diabetes itself. 
there are many people who have to endure different things so that they can be able to manage to live with diabetes. Like someone is supposed to take a shot in the morning and they cannot afford breakfast or they cannot afford lunch. So they either tend to cut off their insulin, which leads to poor uh, management of diabetes, or I met a youth once and he said that he, he literally asked me for 1,000, it's like very little money if we convert it into dollars, to, to, to be able to buy a, a, a drink. Coca-Cola or Fanta, like to get soda or to get a juice so that he can be able to take his shot. So to others, it may this seem like it's little money, but it's not. Like someone can really not afford, because it's less than $1, but someone can really not afford to have that so that they can be able to take their insulin doses the way it's supposed to be taken. Uh, apart from that, I think we should also leave in Tanzania, the challenge is also a bit in the sufficient and efficient access to insulin itself, where in uh, primary health centers, we may have a situation where you get, you find that a patient is using both atropid and lancer, but they can only get lancer and cannot access atropid, because atropid is more high in demand, and it's been found to be more efficient for most people, especially the youth and the children. So you find that you get one medication you do not get the other so you still have to incur the cost of having both and also uh in part of the supply itself they only give one valve of each per patient for a month so especially for kids who are in boarding school and whatnot or even the ones who are just in school they have to go they always have to have that monthly hospital visit so that they can fully have their medical supplies Great. Thank you so much, Anita. And I love what you said about the living cost of diabetes. I think that's so important. It's such a good way to say it because it, it is also making choices every day beyond just your medicine, making sure, and also, you know, making sure also you have sugars for when you're low. I mean, there's so many additional costs that you have to determine just to, to get by it. So I, I appreciate that. Um, okay, Agram, could you answer the same qu question? Hi. Hello, sure. Thank you, Molly. Um, many thanks and congratulations on the film, by the way. It's okay. uh, as for the situation, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, we've lost you for a second. Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, the connection is being uh, a little oh. weak. Hey, okay. If you if you need to, you can turn off your camera. I think that's okay. If that helps, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, let's try. Okay. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, as for your question, um, the situation in Kyrgyzstan is uh, quite interesting because we do have insulin provided uh, free of charge um, by the government, by the state. Uh, however, uh, I think the um, expression that the intention is pretty much there, but the execution is pretty poor, um, pretty much applies to our situation because uh, we do have... Um, a problem of uh, purchasing uh, the insulin because uh, the animal, um, the almost seventy-five percent, uh, up to eighty percent of the budget of insulin of on diabetes uh, is spent on buying the analogs, and uh, the other parts, uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned er earlier, uh, there are lots of layers of the diabetes cost. They are, they often remain overlooked. Uh, the other um, part is that there are over 200 and uh, 2,500 patients with type 1 diabetes, and uh, the, uh, those who are uh, under 18 years of age are provided uh, with analog insulins, mm, whereas the total number of patients with uh, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes uh, is up to 60,000, I think, so which leaves um, over 55,000 people, uh, you know, without proper treatment. Uh, and 
the uh, the civil society organizations uh, have been trying to to uh, push uh, for certain reform in making Oh, I think we've lost Igram there for a minute. Well, hopefully she'll be able to come back on. I think she, she raised some super interesting points, especially um, when uh, thinking about, um, you know, if the government can provide insulin, but are they able to actually pr provide a whole care package for people who are living with diabetes? Because one is not enough for people to, to live with diabetes. Agram, if you, if you can come back in, that's fine. I'll, I'll let you join. But in the meantime, I'm just going to ask you, Anita, um, in terms of, of what you think um, as that main action that you believe, it's the same question I've asked the other panelists, the main action you believe that must be taken to improve access to insulin, what, do you, what would you say that, that main thing to move forward would be? Uh, I think the, the main thing or the thing that we should try and look into is having a global fund, a global fund which is started for NCDs and especially those NCDs which are uh, life living, life dependent on medication such as that uh, insulin, especially for type 1 diabetes. As in the comments and in the chat, I saw that we should also have this awareness of prevention for type 2 diabetes, which can be prevented or at least we can delay the complications of it. But it would really be a good uh, motion or a good way into government and globally to look into having a global fund for NCDs, especially for the people who are dependent on medications such as insulin itself. Also to have um, the total supply of insulin and the related equipment and need for uh, such as testing materials, uh, test strips, the machines, diagnos the diagnostic kits, in even the primary health centers and primary health facilities, where people really wouldn't have to move from far distances in rural areas to urban areas to be able to be diagnosed or to get treatment or even to get the right treatment. Because you may actually get treatment for diabetes even in rural areas, but it may be the wrong treatment. The moment you tell a doctor or a nurse who is uninformed that you're diabetic, they totally start treating a condition which they do not know what's wrong. You may be going there with a hypoglycemia and they may start shooting you with insulin, which leads to a lot of loss of life due to uh, lack of proper education and knowledge about diabetes as a whole. And uh, the proper usage of insulin is very important especially in areas where I think this has to go back, back to the patients themselves and uh, the healthcare providers for them to have a proper and good engagement and good relationship for one to be able to have open and good communication with the patient and the patient with the doctor. For example, uh, there are conditions when, for example, a patient is out of insulin and they ask a fellow friend. And you find that they're having two different medications. One is on atrophy, the other one is novo rapid. But they tend to exchange so that you help the other person. But you give them a different medication without telling them how effective or how it works, which also really tends to lead to many complications and also loss of life. So I think there's a need to increase education, increase awareness, and find means to have a global fund which will be able to help even those who are out of the system of getting donations or assistance of insulin. Great, thank you, Anita. And yeah, I think education of, of the health healthcare force is so important, especially in rural areas. So people don't have to travel for such distances just to get you know the, the health, the basic health they need and also the medicines they need. Because that, I mean, as we saw in the documentary, that's, that can cause a, a major disruption in, in people's lives. Um, Agram, are you able to get back on if, to answer the last question? Uh, hello, yes, can you hear Hi. me now? Yeah, hello. I can hear you now. Yeah, great. Wonder if, um, thanks, we got, I think we got most of, of what you were saying. Um, 
Uh, and you know, if there's any last things you want to say that we got to um, your second point about you know the different um, insulins in Kyrgyzstan. If there's anything else you want to add to that, great. Um, and then also, if you could just let us know what you believe is this this main action that needs to be taken to improve access to insulin. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, just to uh, add a couple of points uh, for the first question. Uh, the challenge in Kyrgyzstan is that um, the analog uh, insulins are very expensive and most of the funds are allocated to purchasing those. Um, and I think uh, the main challenge is that uh, the planning of the budget for purchasing those are, is actually very inadequate. Uh, and I think the uh, resource allocation uh, should be in policy should be um, the main priority because the, the insulin is uh, accessible. However, uh, a lot of the, the, the big chunk of the funds is allocated to something um, to the part where only a few patients uh, are benefiting from. Uh, and um, following up on this uh, idea, I think what needs to be done is that uh, the policies should be um, approached, I think, uh, more um, carefully because I think in Kyrgyzstan, especially uh, where we have this very strong presence of the Soviet Union legacy with the central plant economy, uh, I think it's still very much present in how the healthcare system works because uh, I think uh, the Minister of Healthcare, for example, <clears throat> has this um, budget uh, for 2021, for example, and then they provide this to the Minister of Finance uh, without even you know, considering that some of the funds that are prescribed in the, in the budget, um, they're not really necessary and are redundant. Um, and I think those crucial uh, points have to be considered and those funds need to be allocated to something necessary, uh, like purchasing uh, the insulin uh, and making it more affordable so it doesn't really overburden the healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you, Agram. I think that's, I, I like that what you said about being careful about policy. I think that's also a really important consideration to ensuring, you know, the best policy for the most amount of people. Um, well, thank you all to all of the panelists um, for the great questions. I'm going to open it up to the q and I see there are already some questions here. Um, just a couple, I'm just gonna quickly answer a little bit. Um, there was one about storage and um, heat. And I think you'll see in the chat, there was a study that was done by um, Life for a Child and um, Santa Diabet, and I think MSF was involved, that looked at um, clay pots. And I think the, the, the um, link is in the chat if you wanna look at that. Um, and I think there was something about um, insulin, I think the other one is about insulin and the WHO has released a study about that with MSF that just showed the, the temperature that insulin can be unrefrigerated. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to share, um, it's, it's not heat resistant, but it, it's a different uh, temperature range that's a little bit higher than it had been thought of before. If somebody has that link, if you could share it in the chat, that would be great. Um, we also had another question about prevention of type 2 diabetes um, and, you know, not including this in our film. And of course, I mean, um, prevention is a, is, a huge, is a huge priority for diabetes. And of course, it helps with access to insulin because hopefully less people will need insulin if, if they don't have diabetes to start with. But, you know, for our focus, it's just helping the people who are, already have diabetes and need insulin at the moment and are, are making sure that that remains a priority so that these people can continue to, to, to survive and survive and thrive. Um, so um, I'm gonna ask a question about, um, a lot of people mentioned education and support. So I'm wondering, um, maybe uh, Dr. Leon, if you could answer this question. It's, and if somebody else has the answer to it, please feel free to chip in, is talking about um, the use of nurses um, trained for care, um, and um, if, if that's something that you use in your hospital to train nurses to have better reach with their diabetes patients, or if, 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 if it hasn't been done yet. 
And yes, uh, when the patient is discharged in the hospital, we we tell the nurses to um, um, teach the patient how to use the insulin, but uh, it's not structured yet. yet. So we have to may we have to, for example, I have to tell them to do it. It's not uh, a policy. So it depends on the doctor. It depends on the. It's it's not structured. So uh, I do uh, it because I like diabetes. I investigate in diabetes, but not all the doctors uh, do it because it's not structured. So when the patient is, is a chart, the 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 nurse, it, the the relative caregiver or the patient, if he, he can understand. Uh, uh, while I, I'm connected, uh, some ideas I'm crossing my, my head and we have to structure it. We have to teach the nurses and and consider no, uh, the doctors now the only important, very important the clinicians, the nurses, biologists, and all the people that are nutritionists that are related to, to people. Thank you. Yeah, standardize the standardization of the of the training for them is really important and can really help broaden access to treatment um, for, for people. Thank you very much. Okay, um, the next question, we had a question about um, fighting stigma um, within diabetes. Um, Anita, I know you've worked with a lot of young people with diabetes in Tanzania. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about through your work, what you have done to help um, overcome stigma within the diabetes community. Uh, so mostly what we did was to have a society advocacy where we go to, especially to schools, where is where most youth and children and adolescents are, and that's where they spend most of their time. But also we found that stigma really, it begins right from the family itself, which really impacts self-acceptance. Because we usually say that there should be acceptance when it comes to conditions such as diabetes, but it also does involve society acceptance because once the society accepts that you have a condition that you have to live with and you have to endure with it your whole life then only then can one as an individual be able to pursue and fully carry it through so what we did and what we have been doing and still push through is have um school engagement where we 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 give live uh evidence as ourselves as I stand in front of the students and show them that having diabetes is not a hindrance to one's life. It's not like it's not infectious and it does not stop one from enduring or fighting through for their life and attaining their dreams. So we get to be there as living proof. It's usually a lot of diabetic adolescents and kids that we all go as a group and teach and empower the, the ones who are living with diabetes in the school. And usually it doesn't only involve schools which have diabetic students, but just generally schools. And also we tend to have um, media campaigns and pretty much raise awareness and social societal mobilization and advocacy for diabetes, especially against stigma. We fight for stigma right from the family where it's the roots where Many adolescents have also been faced in stigma in, in, uh, in family level, live alone schools and in different societal uh, experiences. So really we've been trying to reach out to all aspects of the society, right from the primary unit to physically bigger group. Thanks, Anita. Yeah, it, it's so important to really get the whole public awareness so people realize it's not, it, it's, you know, once people are visible with diabetes, they realize actually they're just like anybody else, which feels silly to be telling this group because we all know that, but in, in general, thanks very much. So we are now, we've reached the end of the Q&A session. I think, thankfully, my, co my colleague Marg was answering a lot of the questions in the chat already. So, um, Thank you so much. I just want to, um, again, thank all the panelists who participated today. 
And I also, um, yeah, and if you could all just turn your picture on just so everyone can see your face one more time, that would be great. Um, and then I also want to really thank uh, Cloud9 Media so much for um, working on this project. It was a, I, I think it was a labor of love for them. It, it, it was a very long process and we appreciate it. I also really want to also say thank you to Bruna and to Danny for all of their support. Um, and of course, thank everybody at Hi and the comms team here for all of their help in, in promoting this. And um, if you have, uh, you know, any questions, uh, please feel free to email any of us, I think, or let us know. Um, and lastly, you know, as we want to just keep going on this awareness, especially in this 100 year uh, anniversary of uh, discovery of access to insulin, um, if you'd like to share what you believe um, as the audience is the main action that should be taken in terms of improving access to insulin, please feel free to share it on your social media and just use that our hashtag, which is hashtag 100 years on. Uh, that would be great. And we'd love to hear from all of you. Um, and we you know, will retweet everything we can. Um, so anyways, thank you all very much. Um, it was really such a, a great experience to do this. And um, we'll see you next time.